Hi folks, this is Checkpoint Quiz 5.2. We're given a function f of x, and we're told, uh, assuming the function is 1 to 1, find a formula for the inverse function. Okay, so how do we go about finding the formula for an inverse function? Well, the first step is we write the equation y equals f of x. So in this case, that's y equals 3x over x plus 1. So this is, expresses the relationship as x as the input and y as the output. So the inverse function is going to reverse that relationship. So we're going to switch inputs and outputs. We're going to switch the x's and y's. So now it becomes x equals 3y over y plus 1. And now I've got to solve this for y. So the first thing I'll do is multiply both sides by the denominator y plus 1. On the left hand side I get xy plus x. On the right hand side the y plus 1's cancel out. Now I'm looking at this equation. This equation I'm trying to solve for y. Which means I need to get y by himself. If I look at the highest power of y in this equation, it's y to the first. So it's a linear equation in terms of y. And how do we solve things like that? We get everything with y on one side, everything else on the other. So to that end, I'm going to subtract the xy term off both sides. So I'll be left with x on the left hand side is equal to 3y minus xy. And now that I've got y in common to both, I can factor it out. And for the grand finale, I'm going to divide both sides by 3 minus x. So that gives me y equals x divided by 3 minus x. And so the claim is that this is the formula for the inverse function. How do we know that's the formula for the inverse function? That's what part b is all about. Okay, part B, we're asked to check our answer to part A using function composition. So uh, our answer we got for part A was x divided by 3 minus x. So how do we check using function composition? Well, we need to check two compositions. We need to check that f inverse composed with f of x works out to be x. And we also have to check the other way around. So let's go ahead and start with this one. Let's check that f inverse of f of x really and truly does just give us the x back. So, working from the inside out, I replace f of x with its formula, 3x over x plus 1. What do I do here? Well, everywhere I see an x in the formula for f inverse of x, I need to substitute in this fraction. So I'm going to get 3x over x plus 1 divided by 3 minus 3x over x plus 1. I need to simplify that. I'm going to multiply it top and bottom by x plus 1 over x plus 1. Now if you need to, you can think of this x plus 1 as x plus 1 over 1. When I multiply the numerator, I got 3x over x plus 1 times x plus 1 over 1. These guys are going to cancel out, and I'm just left with 3x. In the denominator, I've got two terms here. So I have to distribute that to each of those terms. When I take the x plus 1 times the 3, I get 3 times the quantity x plus 1. Minus, when I take this times this fraction, the x plus 1's once again cancel out, and I'm left with 3x. So the numerator is 3x. In the denominator, I get 3x plus 3 minus 3x which is just 3x over 
3. And so at the end of the day, we've shown that f inverse composed with f of x is equal to just 3. So in order to be considered an inverse function, we also have to check that f undoes the inverse. So I need to look at f of f inverse of x. So this would be f of what? Well, I look at my formula for f inverse. And everywhere I see an x in the formula for f of x, I've got to replace that x with that fraction. So this is 3 times x divided by 3 minus x divided by x divided by 3 minus x plus 1. And once again, I've got a complex fraction, so to simplify it, I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by 3 minus x. And remember, when I do that, I can think of it as multiplying by a fraction, 3 minus x over 1. So in the numerator, when I multiply, these things cancel out. I'm just left with 3x in the numerator. And in the denominator, I have to remember to distribute. When I multiply this to the first term, the 3 minus x in the denominator cancels that out, and I'm just left with an x. When I multiply it by the second term, I just get my 3 minus x. So in the numerator, I've got the 3x. In the denominator, it simplifies to 3, which means, miracle of miracles, that cancels out too. So that'll do it for part B. All right, in part C, we're asked to find the range of f. Now up to this point, we've typically found the ranges geometrically for well-behaved sorts of functions like uh, parabolas and absolute values. Well, this is the key to this one. The range of f, remember, is the set of outputs from f. That's got to match the domain of its inverse. Okay, because inputs, inputs and outputs switch. Now if I look at the inverse function, we had x divided by 3 minus x. And I can quickly spot what the domain of this guy is. The only thing that could go wrong is if this denominator is equal to 0, or in other words, if x equals 3. So the domain of the inverse function would be all real numbers x except 3, which we write in interval notation as minus infinity to 3, union 3 to infinity. That means that the range of f is exactly that, minus infinity to 3, union 3 to infinity. And if you have the time, it's good preparation for the exam to actually take this function f of x and go through the six-step process we talked about in chapter four, and you'll see that you've got a horizontal asymptote at y equals three, and in fact, it never crosses that horizontal asymptote, which explains the gap in the range at y equals three. Well, that'll do it for number one. All right, number two has the dreaded word explain in it. Uh, explain why a function with more than one x-intercept cannot be invertible. So let's try to parse what's going on here. Um, we know what x-intercepts are. What's invertible mean? Well, that's the property of being of having an inverse. So what would happen if you had a function, say y equals f of x, and it had more than one x-intercept? So let's say, conservatively, it's got two x-intercepts, say here and here. Why can't that function be invertible? In other words, why can't that function have an inverse? Well, here's why. If we think geometrically, the main tool we have to detect if a function has an inverse is the horizontal line test. So, if a function has more than one x-intercept, it's going to fail the horizontal line test because the horizontal line, y equals 0, aka the x-axis, is going to cross the graph more than once. And that's pretty much all there is to this. 
So we'd say if y equals f of x has more than one x-intercept, its graph fails the horizontal line test. Specifically, the horizontal line y equals zero. Hence, f inverse does not exist. And that's all there is for number two. And that'll do it for Checkpoint Quiz 5.2.